Hi everyone, voters are turning this election day into a referendum on President George Bush as well as the war in Iraq with polls closed in almost half the country. Here is how the fight for control of the House and Senate is shaping up right now. In the House, with all 435 seats up for grabs, CBS News estimates Republicans have won 90 seats, the Democrats have won 87 seats. By the end of the night, the Democrats need to take 15 seats from the Republicans in order to win control. Right now, CBS News estimates that Democrats have a net gain of one seat. Now looking at some key winners in the Senate, CBS News estimates that Bob Casey Jr. has defeated Republican incumbent Senator Rick Santorum. Casey is an anti-abortion, pro-gun Catholic, representative of a new breed of Democrat. And in Ohio, Congressman Sherrod Brown has defeated Republican incumbent Senator Mike DeWine. Ohio is often seen as a real bellwether state for the rest of the election. The fight for control in the Senate should come down to races in these eight states. The Democrats have to hold on to their seats in Maryland and New Jersey and then must win four of the other six key races to take control. No decision yet in key Senate races in Missouri, Tennessee, and Virginia. Stay with CBS for all the results. At 10 Eastern, we'll take an hour-long look at today's election. I'm Katie Couric. You're watching Election Night here on CBS. Hi everyone, a majority of voters this election night are saying they think the country is on the wrong track. The last time voters told us that was in the big turnover election of 1994 and change may be coming in this election this year. Let's take a look at how the fights for the House and the Senate are shaping up right now. In the House with about half the races accounted for, CBS News estimates Republicans have won 135 seats, the Democrats 147. By the end of the night, the Democrats need to take 15 seats from the Republicans to win control. Right now, CBS News estimates they have a net gain of one seat. Now looking at some key winners in the Senate. CBS News estimates that Republican Senator Bob Menendez has held on to his seat in New Jersey, defeating Tom Kane Jr., the son of the very popular governor and the chairman of the 9-11 Commission. And in a slam dunk race for one of the Senate's big names, CBS News estimates that Senator Hillary Clinton has handily defeated her opponent, John Spencer. The fight for control in the Senate should come down to the races in these seven states. The Democrats must hold on to their seat in Maryland, and they must win four of the other six key races in order to take control. No decisions yet in other key Senate races in Virginia, Missouri, Tennessee, Arizona, and Rhode Island. Polls are still open in 10 states. We'll have a full hour of coverage at 10. I'm Katie Couric. You're watching Election Night here on CBS. Tonight, the battle for Congress. Can the Democrats take control or will the Republicans hang on? And what are Americans saying about the man who is not on the ballot, President Bush? Voters are having the final word of campaign 06. It's election night in America. Campaign 06, election night. From CBS News election headquarters in New York, here is Katie Couric. Hi, everyone. Good evening. Well, if you voted, you're helping to decide who will control the Congress for the next two years, the Republicans, the Democrats, or both. For the next hour, we'll be telling you what happened tonight, why it happened, and what it all means for Congress, the president, and the next big election in 2008, and most of all, what it means to you. There's a lot at stake tonight, so let's get started. It's just after 10 in the East. Polls are closed in most of the country. So let's take a look first at the battle for the House of Representatives. In the House, CBS News estimates that so far Republicans have won 142 seats. The Democrats have won 155. By the end of the night, the Democrats need to take 15 seats from the Republicans in order to win control. So far, CBS News estimates they have a net gain of nine seats. Meanwhile, in the Senate tonight, there have been a few turnovers in the races. Sheldon Whitehouse in Rhode Island, the Democratic challenger to Senator Lincoln Chafee, the Republican, has defeated the incumbent. Chafee is a moderate Republican who has actually voted more liberally than many Democrats on Capitol Hill, and he opposed the war in Iraq from the very start. Nevertheless, Sheldon Whitehouse, who said, have a White House in Washington you can trust, has won in the state of Rhode Island. In the state of Pennsylvania, Bob Casey Jr. has defeated 
Incumbent Republican Senator Rick Santorum, Bob Casey, is a Catholic. He is anti-abortion, pro-gun, said to be representative of a new breed of more socially conservative Democrat. In the state of Ohio, Representative Sherrod Brown has defeated Republican incumbent Mike DeWine. And the Democrats held on to two of their embattled seats in the state of Maryland. The Democrats have won, as we mentioned. Congressman Ben Cardin has defeated Lieutenant Governor Michael Steele, despite the fact that Steele got endorsed by many African-American officials in the state of Maryland. Also, in the state of New Jersey, Bob Menendez holding on to his seat, defeating Tom Kane Jr., the son of a very popular former governor of New Jersey. But that state has not elected a Republican senator since 1972. The fight for control in the Senate should come down to the races in these five states. The Democrats must win three of these key races in order to take control of the Senate. Bob Schieffer is our chief Washington correspondent and anchor of Face the Nation, and he is our dean of our election night team. He's seen a few of these congressional elections. I think this is number 22, in fact, for you, Bob. It is. So what are you seeing tonight? Well, I'll tell you, Katie. Uh, this uh, we knew was going to be a bad night for the Republicans, but it may be shaping up as their worst nightmare. The big news of this election is turning out to be it is a referendum on the Bush administration. More than 60 percent of the voters who went to the polls today told us that they considered national issues more important than local issues. Now that's extraordinary. Nearly 60 percent they said they do not approve of the war in Iraq and more than 80 percent of those people voted for the Democrats. If the Democrats can, as you say, hold on to the seats that they held at the beginning of the evening, plus what they have picked up tonight, all they need now is to win three more seats held by Republicans and they take control of the Senate. Now this is what has to worry the White House right now. Independents are a big part of this vote today and they are going by a substantial margin to Democrats all across the country, Katie. Which is a big change. They haven't done that since 1986, right, Bob? Absolutely. We had a poll last week that showed that half the people who call themselves independents said they were going to vote Democratic, and the trend is certainly uh, making that poll come true. All right, Bob Schieffer, Bob. And, of course, here with Bob and me on our election night team tonight, our national political correspondent, Gloria Borger, is analyzing the key Senate races. Our Capitol Hill correspondent, Cheryl Ackeson, is following the battle for the House of Representatives. Anthony Mason is looking at our national exit poll to find out what's on voters' minds. And we have correspondents all across the country. But first, let's go to Gloria Borger, who's watching the tight battle for the Senate. Gloria, it's pretty exciting, isn't it? It is, Katie. And let's talk a little bit about those turnovers you mentioned at the beginning of the show, because the results there really, I think, show that this is a change election that we're witnessing tonight. First of all, let's look at Rhode Island, where Democrat Sheldon Whitehouse defeated Republican incumbent Lincoln Chafee. Lincoln Chafee, as you mentioned, is a liberal Republican. He couldn't run far enough away from the president, yet our exit poll said that 35 percent of the voters said that he agreed with the president too much, and that really helped in his defeat. Ohio, Pennsylvania, those were not a surprise, but Katie, there were across-the-board rejections of the Republicans, of their policies, and of the president in both of those states. All right, Gloria, we'll be checking in with you momentarily. Meanwhile, Cheryl Atkinson has been following the House races. What's going on there, Cheryl? Well, this is pretty big, Katie. We estimate that Democrats have picked up a key seat in Kentucky held by Ann Northup, and we can't emphasize enough how important this is, and here's why. Northup has survived the good, the bad, and the ugly in the past in this evenly divided district. She's a ferocious fundraiser, and even her fellow Republicans told me they don't want to cross her. They were counting on her to survive the night. John Yarmouth attached her to President Bush and the war in Iraq, and it looks like the label stuck. Also, a couple more results we're just getting. Democrats are picking up a late-breaking seat in New Hampshire. I'm sure one they didn't start worrying about until four days ago, and um, we're following uh, Indiana, where they've also picked up three competitive seats there. That's big, Katie. All right, Cheryl, thanks so much. Meanwhile, our Lee Cowan has been holding down the fort, literally in Ohio, for the past month or so, watching some of those key congressional races there because it's considered a real bellwether state and indicative of what the rest of the country might do, right, Lee? 
Well, it is. And tonight, I think, Katie, we're seeing the first of what may be uh, uh, the result of scandal here in the Buckeye State. We're now projecting uh, in the 18th District of Ohio that Democrat Zach Space uh, will defeat Joy Padgett. She's a Republican state senator here. Uh, you, she uh, actually replaced Congressman Bob Ney on the ticket. And you might remember Bob Ney just resigned only last Friday. He was one of the first congressmen to get caught up in the Jack Abramoff scandal. So again, we're projecting, estimating uh, that Zach Space uh, will defeat Joy Padgett. Just another example of just how toxic the environment is here for Republicans in this state. Katie? All right, Lee Cowan, thanks so much. Meanwhile, as we mentioned, mentioned Anthony Mason has been following what voters are thinking and saying as they leave the polls. And, and it really was a referendum in many ways on the Bush presidency, wasn't it, Anthony? Absolutely, Katie, and here's how the Bush factor played out. More than 40% of the voters we spoke to today told us they strongly disapprove of the job that President Bush is doing. Now, when you add that together with the 15% who somewhat disapprove, well, then you've got nearly 60% of the voters. What happens then in the voting booth? Well, take a look at this. 37% of the people we spoke to today said their vote in the House race was specifically a vote against President Bush. Not a majority, go, but go back to, go back to, 19, to 2002, rather, and you'll see that 18%, the number then, has more than doubled. So also, people, about 30% of the voters we spoke to today said they were angry at President Bush. What happened to them? Well, more than 90% voted for the Democrats. Katie? All right, Anthony, I think you need a few lessons from John Madden, <laughs> but you're doing a good job. Meanwhile, Jim Axelrod is at the White House where the president is watching the returns. What is the mood there, Jim? Well, I just talked to a high-level Republican strategist, Katie. He's been in touch with staffers inside the White House and describes the mood as glum. Specifically, they're watching this Rhode Island Senate race that Gloria Borgia was just talking about. They really thought at 3, 4, 5 o'clock this afternoon that Lincoln Chafee was going to pull it out. Since it appears he won't, it's really cut into the, the wind in their sails at the White House. The president's going to have to make a very public pivot tomorrow if the trends hold, because all along the final stretches of this campaign, he has been chiding the Democrats for dancing in the end zone, measuring for drapes, celebrating before any votes were taken. If the trends hold, then as soon as tomorrow, he's going to have to talk about the possibility of working with Democrats in the House or the Senate. Or maybe both, Katie. But, Jim, earlier tonight, the president and his aides were saying not so fast. These exit polls often favor the Democrats. Yeah, I think that they had that argument that their field reports were counter to what they were seeing from the exit polls. But now you're starting to get races called the Cardin race, the Rhode Island race, as I mentioned. This kind of uh, data begins uh, to be, present the kind of picture you just can't argue against. And you have to start to accept what appears to be the inevitable here. All right, Jim Axelrod at the White House. Jim, thank you so much. And we'll have much more of campaign 06 in a moment. You're watching Election Night on CBS. CBS News Election Night coverage is sponsored by New York Life, the company you keep. Welcome back to Election Night, everyone, here on CBS. At this hour, the House and the Senate are both very much in play. Let's take a look at where things stand right now. In the House of Representatives, CBS News estimates Republicans have 144 seats. The Democrats have won 155. By the end of the night, as we mentioned, the Democrats need to take 15 seats from the Republicans to win control. So far, they have a net gain of nine seats. The fight for control in the Senate should come down to the races in these five states. The Democrats must win three of these battleground races in order to take control of the Senate. Let's take a look now at some of these tight races that are undecided at this point. Senator George Allen, the incumbent Republican, is opposed, it was opposed by Jim Webb, the former Secretary of the Navy and the Reagan administration, who recently became a Democrat. Again, that race still undecided in the Commonwealth of Virginia. In the state of Tennessee, another very hotly contested and quite nasty race. Five-term Congressman Harold Ford Jr. is uh, running against Bob Corker, a wealthy businessman and former mayor of Chattanooga. Again, the race is still too close to call. Tennessee has never elected an African-American senator. Meanwhile, in the state of Missouri, another very close race. Senator 
Jim Talent, the Republican incumbent, is running against Claire McCaskill. Again, that race still undecided at this point in time with a very controversial embryonic stem cell initiative on the ballot, which may have helped Claire McCaskill get out the vote. Meanwhile, as Bob Schieffer mentioned earlier, how independents are going is a very interesting and key factor in this election. Anthony Mason has more on that from our exit polls, right, Anthony? Yeah, Katie, we're finding that independents are breaking very strongly for the Democrats today, and here's why. Take a look at this. 67% of the independents told us they disapprove of the job that President Bush is doing. The reason for that, in a word, the war. 65% told us they disapprove of the war in Iraq. In the last midterm, independents split almost evenly. Today, well, you'll see 58% went for the Democrats. A big swing, Katie. All right, Anthony Mason. Thank you, Anthony. Meanwhile, Gloria Borger, as we mentioned, is, being, is covering some of these key Senate races. And how have you seen these independent voters translate into net results for the Democrats? Well, they're very important, Katie, because while both parties seem to be holding their base of support, independent voters seem to be the swing here, and, and they're making the margin uh, of difference. If you look at Missouri, the close race you just spoke about, Democrat Claire McCaskill leads by nine points among independents. That could help her in the long term. And in another close race you mentioned in Tennessee, that is close because Democrat Harold Ford has only eked out a three-point margin among independents. If you look at a race that we've already seen decided in Pennsylvania, 71% of independent voters supported Bob Casey, who beat Rick Santorum. All right, Gloria, thanks so much. And speaking of independence, Bob Schieffer, Joe Lieberman, the former Democratic vice presidential nominee for Al Gore, who lost in the primary and then became mm -hmm. an independent, won handily in Connecticut, didn't he? He did, and this puts Joe Lieberman without question in the catbird seat, because if you have a closely divided Senate now, and whether the Democrats take control or not, it's going to be a very close margin. Everybody is going to be wanting Joe Lieberman's vote. And let's not forget, Democrats turned their backs on Joe Lieberman after he decided to become an independent, so he really doesn't owe them very much. He's going to make them grovel a little bit, right? You, he's got to. But he his, will. <laughs> apparently his mother has said he will not, she will not allow him him to vote with the Republicans. So if he's a mama's boy, I guess there's no contest, right? Well, if he can sell that story, <laughs> it'll be great, but he's, he's going to be in the catbird seat. All right. And speaking <laughs> of Connecticut, that's where we find Byron Pitts tonight, who's covering some key congressional races of moderate Republicans. Byron, what's happening there? Well, Katie, the Democrats have picked up one more seat, and the indication in Connecticut tonight is that moderate Republicans could be in trouble. Let's take a look at the board. In District 5, Republican Congresswoman Nancy Johnson in office 24 years. She is out tonight. She just conceded. Democratic State Senator Chris Murphy is the winner. Now, all along, the Republicans said they could survive if they lost one of three seats, but the it looks tonight like they could be in trouble if they lose all three of those seats. Katie, in Connecticut, it's come down to the issue of Iraq. The three moderate Republicans all supported President Bush, and they're in trouble for that very reason tonight in Connecticut. All right, Byron, thank you so much. And we'll be back with much more of Campaign 06 in a moment. You're watching Election Night here on CBS. It is the first Tuesday after the first Monday in November election night. Let's take a look at where things stand now in the battle for control of Congress. A quick review. In the House, CBS News estimates Republicans currently have 146 seats, the Democrats 156. By the end of the night, as we've been telling you, the Democrats need to take 15 seats from the Republicans in order to win control. They have a net gain of 10 seats so far. Meanwhile, the fight for control of the Senate should come down to the races in these five states, the Democrats must win three of these key races in order to take control. We now turn to our crack panel of political pundits, Mike McCurry, who was the spokesman for the Clinton administration, and Nicole Wallace, communications director, former communications director for the current Bush administration. Mike, discontent with the president 
the war and Congress. Was this about rejecting Republicans more than embracing Democrats? Well, it's a, a little bit about everything. The country is very clearly saying we want a new direction. They don't like the direction the president is taking us. They want some change. It's not only Iraq, it's uh, the economy, it's a bunch of other issues as well. And this is really it is a part of a referendum on George Bush. He is uh, on the minds of voters in a way that most presidents really aren't. Not even Bill Clinton in his midterm elections was as much a factor in those uh, elections as George Bush is tonight. So I, I think you know, one way or another, the White House is going to have to get some message from this election. 30%, according to our exit polls, Nicole's, mm -hmm. of, of Nicole, of voters said they were angry mm -hmm. with the president, which is a really, really high mm -hmm. number, as you well know. Um, how do you think he'll react to voters sending him this message? And you've been on your BlackBerry all night. What are your friends <laughs> at the White House part. saying about this? Well, look, they talk a lot about history. Now, you look at midterm elections, and historically, the president's party takes a big hit. Uh, president Clinton lost 54 seats in his first midterm. So there is a tide of history that every president swims against. They also look at this climate, where there's been a, um, you know, a plethora of scandals that have plagued House Republicans. And there's also, obviously, a lot of angst in the country about Iraq. So they understand this climate, but they are, at this hour, very cautiously optimistic about their chances in some of these very tight races. So they say, wait and see. Let's not analyze the results until we see what's going to happen tonight. At this juncture, is that cautious optimism warranted? That, that's what I would say if I were at the White House, too, and probably did say that. Uh, but, you know, this is not a time to be thinking about staying the course. It's really a time to think about how are we going to deal with what is going to be a divided government, it looks like, and how do we move this country in a new direction? Well, let's talk about Iraq real quickly, if I could, Nicole, because according to our exit polls, 58% of respondents say said they oppose the war. 59 say it hasn't made the U.S. safer from terrorism. But realistically, what can Congress do to, to change foreign policy? Well, very little, because uh, the commander-in-chief is the commander-in-chief. Congress can hold hearings. It can look into the decisions that led to the war. Uh, it can try to hold the White House accountable. But this will really be a test of whether our national leadership comes together to do something uh, that the country wants. The country wants us to get it right in Iraq and change direction. And they, if they don't get that result, the anger towards both Congress and the president will be profound. But, Nicole, Vice President Cheney said as recently as Sunday that no matter what happens in these midterm elections, the policy in Iraq will not change. At some point, uh, don't you believe that the White House needs to show greater flexibility? Well, I think you can take any comment in isolation, and, and certainly um, I don't think you'll hear the president um, you know, talk in a way that makes it sound like he's not listening. He is listening, and I think you'll see him uh, maybe pull the curtain back a little bit more in all of that consultation that really does happen at and the White House. I've seen it. Democrats come in, and, and they share their views, and they're very frank. The James Baker Lee Hamilton plan is coming right. down the pike. All right, thank you very much. We'll be back in a moment. You're watching Election Night here on CBS. CBS News election night coverage continues. Here again is Katie Couric. Welcome back to CBS News election night coverage. At this hour, both houses of Congress remain up for grabs as voters tell us they are dissatisfied with President Bush, the war, and the direction of the country. Here's a quick look at how things are standing right now. In the House of Representatives, CBS News estimates Republicans currently hold 148 seats, the Democrats 158 seats. By the end of the night, as we've been saying all along, the Democrats need to take 15 seats from the Republicans to win control. Right now, CBS News estimates the Democrats have a net gain of 11 seats so far. Meanwhile, the fight for control of the Senate should come down to these key races in five states. The Democrats must win three of these key races in order to take control of the Senate. Bob Schieffer, things are really tight in these five races. They aren't really they? are. And, you know, we may not know. Uh, before midnight or after midnight uh, who is going to control the Senate. But the thing is, this airplane is landing at exactly the airport that we thought it was. It's going to land in Virginia, Tennessee, Missouri, and Montana, it seems to me. Those are the races where this thing is going to be 
this side. And we didn't mention much about that Montana race, which is so interesting because the incumbent is Conrad Burns. President mm -hmm. Bush campaigned for him. He's a longtime senator, and he's being uh, opposed by a man named John Tester, who's really a new breed of Democrat in that state. He's aligning himself with Brian Schweitzer, the very popular Democratic mm -hmm. governor. And my favorite fact about him, Bob, is he's missing three fingers on his left hand as the result of a meat grinding accident when he was just nine years old. But he can still pull the trigger on that shotgun with, it, with, his, with his right finger. That's right, because he's very pro-gun as yes, well. Anyway, we're going to go to Anthony Mason, who's got some interesting poll results for us, don't you, Anthony? Yeah, Katie, we've been talking about the war all night. Voters not only strongly disapprove of the war, they don't believe it's making us any more secure. When we asked them if the war was improving our long-term security, 59% said they don't believe it is, and most of them want us out of Iraq as well. If you take a look at this, you'll see that 56% down here want us to withdraw some or all of the 152,000 troops. In addition to the casualties, the wars cost us $320 billion, Katie, and tonight it may have cost the Republicans this election. All right, Anthony, thanks so much. Let's turn to Gloria Borger now, who can tell us how the Iraq factor is playing out in some of these key Senate races. What are you seeing, Gloria? Well, in three of the key states we've been talking about all night, Katie, Tennessee, Missouri and Montana. One of the reasons these states are so close is because the electorate is almost evenly divided on the war. And that is very a very, very important factor. Also, I just want to get back to the state of Montana you were, you were talking about, because also their corruption is such a central issue. That's been a real issue in the House races. It's also an issue in this important state because of this lobbyist, Conrad Burns. One thing, uh, I'm sorry, this lobbyist, Jack Abramoff, uh, one thing we've noticed in our exit polls is that 40 percent of the people in the state of Montana identified corruption as extremely important. And, and Conrad, that, I was going to say, Gloria, Conrad Burns was referred to as Jack Abramoff's favorite senator, right? That's right. And, and Katie, 80 percent of the people in Montana know who Jack Abramoff is because the Democrats have been running ads for a year about him. And by the way, it's an interesting uh, statistic in our exit polls, four in ten voters said corruption and scandal was extremely important to them and the way they voted. Cheryl Ackeson, have you seen corruption and scandal having an influence in some key House races yes, as well? Yes, we have, Katie. Um, I think you could call that the third big national factor behind President Bush and the war in Iraq. Uh, Pennsylvania had two of those seats where that was at play. Let's look at Pennsylvania 7. We say that Republican Kurt Weldon will fall, we estimate, to the Democrat there. He was considered, Weldon, very safe. He's held that seat since 1986 until he was accused of using his congressional position to help his daughter to funnel lobbying business her way into another friend. Also, Pennsylvania 10, this was a factor in the race with Republican Don Sherwood, who we estimate loses to Chris Carney. Uh, Sherwood, you may have heard about him, was accused of choking his mistress and then settling with her. Uh, as part of the lawsuit, it was reported she had to keep quiet till after the election. The Republicans knew the scandal factor would hurt them, and it is hurting them dearly tonight. Yeah, that last one, a particularly charming race. Meanwhile, Joe Sestak, one of the many Iraqi veterans who ran for office, fighting or really campaigning against the war. Bob Schieffer, you had a thought about scandal and corruption? Well, I mean, I always thought that hypocrisy was the number one political crime, and I think that was the factor uh, with the, the, the Foley scandal, the, the Page scandal, it's just, just hypocrites, and that's always a bad thing. But I'm beginning to think now choking your mistress may top may top uh, <laughs> hypocrisy what? as and, the number one political crime. And we should mention, Bob, that 54% other people polled in our exit polls said they disapproved of the way the GOP handled the Foley mess. Mm -hmm. And I think sort of a national scandal exacerbated some of the state scandals that, that people said, hey, we're sick of this. Yeah, it just added to this, you know, we're losing confidence in the government. And the throw the bums out mentality, yeah. right? Yeah. Anyway, we'll have much more of Campaign 06 in just a moment. You're watching Election Night here on CBS. <laughs> Good evening again. Polls everywhere in America, everywhere but Alaska will be closed just a few minutes from now. We still can't tell you 
who will have control of the House or Senate in the new Congress. But here's what we can tell you, how things are shaping up right now. In the House, CBS News now estimates the Republicans have won 149 seats, the Democrats 159. By the end of the night, the Democrats need to take 15 seats away from the Republicans to win control. So far, they have a net gain of 11 seats. The fight for control of the Senate, as we've been mentioning, there are, there are five key states. The Democrats must win three of these key races in order to take control of the Senate. Jim Axelrod has been at the White House all night long watching these returns and talking to White House officials and, and various aides. The notion of d a divided government, how do you think the White House will deal with that, Jim, if, that, if it turns out to be? Well, actually, there's some history here. You know, in, in May of 2001, there was a senator in Vermont, uh, Jim Jeffords, who switched parties from Republican to Democrat, and the president had to work for about a year and a half with the Demo Democratic Senate. He passed three signature programs as, part, as far as his legislation goes, No Child Left Behind, the Patriot Act, and some tax cuts. So there's some precedent here. Anybody who's been to Texas will tell you that when he was Governor Bush, he was known for being able to work with Democrats. So there is some precedent here. One other point, Katie, is we're watching this Senate thing unfold. If it's Montana, where it all comes down to, keep this in mind. That, that Montana is one of the states so conservative. In fact, it went in 96 for Bob Dole. So tuck that away into the stew pot as well. All right. Thank you very much, Jim. We'll do that. Gloria Borger has some thoughts, I understand. Gloria? Yes, I do. You know, I, I think at this point, if you were sitting upstairs uh, at the White House, uh, if you were President Bush, you'd be thinking now about your legacy. The L word always comes to a president's mind uh, at this point, particularly if you may lose one or two houses in the Congress. And I think you're going to have three parties, Katie. You're going to have the administration, and you're going to have the Republicans, and you're going to have the Democrats, if the Democrats control one or two houses. And each has his own self-interest, and they will work together when it's in their self-interest. And I, I would think that it might be in Congress's interest now to get something done, because that's what we're hearing from the voters. And so they might actually actually take a look at an issue like Social Security or right. immigration. Okay, and that, that, those are good points, especially on immigration. Bob, you know, we heard about these conservative Democrats, and I guess the question is, how unified will the Democrats be if, in fact, they take control of the House of Representatives? Because Nancy Pelosi and some of these more socially conservative Democrats may not see eye to eye on the agenda. I think that Nancy Pelosi, if she does become the first woman speaker of the House of Representatives, her main problem is not going to be with the Republicans. It's, it's uh, dealing with these two wings of her party. She's got these firebrand liberals on the left, many of whom are ready right now to try to impeach George Bush, and she's got these conservative Democrats on the right. She's got to find a way to bring them together. That's going to be her, her main job. All right, now comes the fun part of the evening, winners and losers. We've asked everyone to pick their winners and losers. Bob, you start. I would have to say Joe Lieberman is the big winner. Everybody's going to need his vote in a closely divided Senate. Whoever controls it, he'll have a lot of power. I think the loser is John Kerry. John Kerry made, I think, 128 appearances for Democratic candidates, and he told one bad joke, and that may have derailed his chances of getting the nomination in 2008 for the Democrats. And a recent poll said 84 percent of voters were aware of that joke, and 19 percent said it was going to influence their their vote today in the midterm elections. All right, Nicole, we've done a switcheroo. We want you to pick a winner <laughs> and a loser, but not in your party. Right. Well, I think is, is it going to be impossible to pick no, a, a no, Democratic no, no, winner? No. I am a fan of many Democrats. I think Barack Obama's star really rose during this campaign cycle, and so I think he would be the winner. He generated a lot of excitement in Iowa, which is really gold in presidential politics. And then I think that um, the loser on the Democratic side is Ned Lamont. I think he proved to the country that being a a single issue anti war candidate is not where the country is in Iraq, and that is a good sign. All right, Mike McCurry. Well, winners I, and losers. I'm struck by her mention of Barack Obama. You have to mention that Hillary Clinton is winning by a very You're large cheating. margin. You tonight, have to pick so. Republican winners. Re okay. And in New how York. About, <laughs> how about, we knew it was impossible. <laughs> how about moments from now the polls will close in California? It looks very likely that Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger has come back from a real political near death experience to be reelected there. Great. He did that by, by moving to the center, working closely with Democrats in the state legislature and crafting a more moderate agenda. Mm -hmm. uh, I think on the on the 
loser side, I have to say John McCain. Now, this might not be fair to Senator McCain, but he went around the country campaigning in favor of George Bush's policies on Iraq, in favor of an immigration policy that got him in trouble, frankly, with his own Republican conservative wing, and really trying to look political by reaching out to the conservative wing of the party. So I don't know that he had such a great campaign. Very quickly in closing, as Rodney King might say, can't they all just get along? Are they going to be able to work together? Quick answer. My, my prediction is uh, on the Democratic side, Speaker-elect Pelosi, if that's what she is by tomorrow, will reach out uh, to the president and indicate that we're going to work together to get the nation's problem solved. I think the public and the Democrats often underestimate the president's ability to really succeed and enjoy reaching across party lines and getting a lot of things done. All right. Well, some of you are leaving us now for your local news, but before you go, one last look at where things stand right now. In the House, CBS News estimates that Republicans have so far, according to our graphic, won 149 seats. The Democrats are up to 160. They need a net gain of 15 to take control. And so far, I'm sorry, they need to get 15 to take control. And they have a net gain so far of 12. And for the Senate, it comes down to key races in these five states. The Democrats must win three of these key races in order to take control. Much more about this election night on our website, on your late local news, and first thing tomorrow on The Early Show, and a complete wrap-up on the CBS Evening News. For all of us at CBS News, good night, and thank you for watching. Good evening, everyone. Our headline of the hour, the Democrats take control of the House of Representatives. The Senate, however, is still in play. By a nearly two to one margin, voters are telling our exit poll that this, this election is about national, not local issues. And they're saying they disapprove of both President Bush and the war in Iraq. Let's take a look at where things stand right now. In the House, CBS News estimates that Republicans have won 149 seats, the Democrats 161. Turning now to the Senate, CBS News estimates Republican Senator John Kyle has won re-election in the state of Arizona. The Democrats have picked up three seats, including Rhode Island, where Sheldon Whitehouse has unseated Republican incumbent Lincoln Chafee. In Pennsylvania, where Bob Casey Jr. has defeated incumbent Rick Santorum. And in the Buckeye state of Ohio, where Sherrod Brown defeated incumbent Mike DeWine. Control of the Senate will be determined in three, or actually four key states, pardon me, Virginia, Tennessee, Missouri and Montana. Democrats need to win three of those four seats to take control. Finally, CBS News estimates California Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger has been reelected. Polls have closed everywhere except Alaska. For those of you in the West, we'll have a full hour of election coverage at 10 p.m. Pacific time. I'm Katie Couric. You're watching Election Night here on CBS. Changes on Capitol Hill and the control of Congress. An off-year election sends a shot across the White House bows with major changes. Democrats win control of the House after 12 years of Republican rule. Election 2006, the morning after. This is the CBS Morning News for Wednesday, November 8th. Thanks for joining us. I'm Susan McGinnis. Republican rule is no longer the rule in Washington. The midterm elections turned out to be a watershed for the Democrats and a blow to President Bush. Democrats now control the House of Representatives while control of the Senate remains up for grabs. The old Senate looked like this. 55 Republicans, 44 Democrats, one independent. With Democrats winning four of six Republican seats, the new Senate so far looks like this. 49 Republicans, 47 Democrats, and two independents. Control of the Senate hinges on two races still undecided in Virginia and Montana. In Virginia, Democrat Jim Webb holds a thin lead over Republican incumbent George Allen. A recount is likely. Absentee ballots will be counted today. In Montana, Democratic challenger John Tester holds a slight lead over three-term Republican incumbent Conrad Burns, who was caught up in the Jack Abramoff lobbying scandal. 
Well, in the House, the outcome was clear and decisive as Democrats rode a wave of discontent with President Bush and the war in Iraq. The vote puts California Representative Nancy Pelosi in line to be the first woman speaker. As of early this morning, Democratic, no Democratic incumbent had lost. The old House looked like this, 232 Republicans, 202 Democrats, and one Independent. And in the just-elected House, Democrats hold 227 seats, Republicans 197, with 11 races still too close to call. President Bush watched the election results at the White House. Exit polls show Republicans not only lost voters because of the war, but even on the issue of fighting terrorism. Susan Roberts is in Washington with more. Susan, good morning. Susan, good morning to you. The 12-year revolution on Capitol Hill by the Republicans is over. Voters have delivered a rebuke of President Bush and the Iraq War. Democrats have something to celebrate. Voters propelled them to power in the House of Representatives, making Nancy Pelosi the first woman speaker. The American people voted for change, and they voted for Democrats to take our country in a new direction. Across the country, the election played out as a referendum on the Iraq War. Democrats handily took the 15 seats they needed to regain the House, picking up three seats in Indiana alone. This morning, control of the Senate is still up in the air. Oh, yeah! Oh, yeah! Oh, yeah! Democrats made big Senate gains, ousting Republican incumbents in Missouri, Rhode Island, Ohio, and Pennsylvania. It's about time that politicians in Washington were held accountable on Iraq, and that's part of the new direction. Connecticut Senator Joe Lieberman is going back to Capitol Hill as an independent. And with a Bob Corker victory, Republicans held on to their seat in Tennessee. Contests in Montana and Virginia are still too close to call. Democrat Jim Webb has a razor-thin lead likely to trigger a recount. We'd like to say that uh, the votes are in and we won. Yeah. <laughs> the point of the matter is... We're still counting votes. It seems if like Democrats win Virginia and Montana, they win control of the Senate. Without both seats, Vice President Dick Cheney's vote would break a tie. Now, incoming House Speaker Nancy Pelosi will be speaking later today, and also President Bush will deliver an afternoon news conference on this Capitol Hill shakeup. Susan? Susan, no doubt it's a huge shift for the Democrats, but really, how much impact could it have on uh, how the president does his job and on foreign policy? Well, we know for sure, Susan, that the Democrats are certainly going to press Bush on his Iraq policy and also on some domestic issues, but ultimately, obviously, he has the final say. Right. How much progress is still questionable. Uh, what, what could be a new Democratic agenda? Obviously, domestic issues, big, uh, raising the minimum wage, also a push for new ethics laws. Uh, pressure on the Bush administration, obviously, to come up with some sort of new Iraq policy, but whether they will get anywhere with that, will remain to be seen. All right, Susan, we'll check in with you again shortly. Susan Roberts in Washington. Senator Joe Lieberman's re-election represents a personal victory. Over the summer, Connecticut Democrats turned their back on him, and it appeared his political career was over. But all that has now changed. Byron Pitts reports. Treated like the family outcast after losing the Democratic primary in August, three-term Senator Joe Lieberman was abandoned by his old party and forced to run as an independent. Tuesday, he combined a strong showing of independent and Republican voters and a number of Democrats to win his fourth term in office. He goes back to Washington, he says, not as a partisan, but as a consensus builder. We're at war with terrorists who want to destroy us. We've got an economy that's challenged from abroad, a health care system, energy system that are broken. Our national government is in deficit. We're not going to solve all those problems and meet those challenges and seize the opportunities of the future unless we stop the partisan nonsense and work together. But how do you make nice with the senators who basically abandoned you when you needed them? Well, we're all grown-ups, and, uh, you know, the Senate ultimately is 100 people uh, going to work in the same place every day, and your, your uh, ability to get things done depends on how well you get along with the other workers, so um, it, it'll be fine. Within hours of claiming victory, Senator Lieberman was already flexing some of that newfound political muscle, calling for a bipartisan strategy to bring the troops home from Iraq. Byron Pitts, CBS News, Hartford, Connecticut. And the president will hold a news conference this afternoon to talk about the election results. And as he prepares to enter his final two years in office, there's already plenty of speculation about who may succeed him.
Cynthia Bowers reports. It was a victory speech for a successful Senate race, but Hillary Clinton has everyone wondering if it was a kickoff for 2008. You know, the message couldn't be clearer that it is time for a new course. If you thought the political season was over, think again. The race for president is just getting underway. And I think you're going to see uh, a lot more activity. You're going to see announcements uh, now that the midterms are over. Clinton is the Democratic frontrunner and was the midterm's biggest spender at nearly $30 million, despite not having a serious challenger. But that could change in 2008 if the man with the huge buzz jumps into the race. I have to step back and see how can I best uh, uh, keep the momentum uh, not for me, but for the Democratic Party and for the country. On the Republican side, John McCain is the expected party frontrunner, and like Obama, he was out on the campaign trail this fall, stumping for candidates and pressing the flesh while dodging questions about his presidential plans. Will you enter all the early contests? I know the last time out, mm -hmm. uh, you skipped a couple. Yeah, I, I would. I, that would be a decision to be made after we decide whether to run or not. But McCain, who had an unsuccessful bid in 2000, may find himself pitted against former New York Mayor Rudy Giuliani, who has national name recognition and high poll numbers for his handling of September 11th, and who was also out of the stump this season. There's plenty of time for us to debate 2008 and who the best candidate would be. The field is wide open, and rumors surround some familiar names, including Democrats Edwards, Biden, Bayh, Richardson, and Dodd, and Republicans Romney, Frist, Hagel, and Gingrich. The run-up to 08 is just beginning, but chances are you may already have seen the next president at a fundraiser near you. Cynthia Bowers, CBS News, Chicago. And just ahead on the morning news, electronic voting, the fears and the reality of an election where nine out of every ten votes was cast or counted by machines. First, Katie Couric with a preview of tonight's CBS Evening News. Hi there. Your vote will take an in-depth look at the issues you've told us you care about most. A full election recap tonight from Washington on the CBS Evening News. We hope to see you then. This portion of the CBS Morning News, sponsored by AstraZeneca, makers of Nexium, the purple pill. This is a CBS News special report. I'm Harry Smith in New York. After the elections yesterday, a major headline today, Republican sources reportedly are saying Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld is resigning. Voters across the country expressed their disapproval of the Bush administration's conduct of the war in Iraq. Meanwhile, a major shift in political power is coming to Capitol Hill. President Bush has called a news conference to talk about it. As you know, the Democrats will be in control of the House for the first time since he's been in the White House. He called Nancy Pelosi, whom we expect Thank to become you, Speaker of the House, to congratulate her. In yesterday's election, the Democrats took at least 27 seats that are now held by Republicans. In the Senate, CBS News estimates that Democrat John Tester has, in fact, defeated Republican incumbent Conrad Burns in Montana. This race uh, was undecided all night long and through the morning hours. Now, to take control of the Senate, the Democrats must win that last seat, still undecided, in Virginia. The president is going to be speaking in just a second from the East Room. Jim Axelrod from our White House, his uh, correspondent corps, is going to talk to us now. What do we know about this, uh, this news about uh, Secretary Rumsfeld? Well, the East Room is buzzing, Harry. What we're told is that Donald Rumsfeld has submitted his resignation. No administration official in the room right now has confirmed this. They're not knocking it down either. We're told Robert Gates will be the new Secretary of Defense, a former head of the CIA and close friend of the president's father, President George H.W. Bush. But here's President Bush to give all the details about this, Harry. All right, thanks. United States. Thank you. Say, why all the glum faces? Yesterday, the people went to the polls. And they cast their vote for a new direction in the House of Representatives. And while the ballots are still being counted in the Senate, it is clear the Democrat Party had a good night last night. And I congratulate them on their victories. This morning, I spoke with Republican and Democrat leadership in the House and the Senate. I spoke with uh, Republican leaders, Senator Frist and Senator McConnell and Speaker Hastert and uh, John Boehner and 
Roy Blunt, I thanked them for their hard-fought uh, contest. This is a CBS News special report. I'm Katie Couric reporting from Capitol Hill in the nation's capital. Hi everyone. Well, the news just keeps breaking here today. All fallout from yesterday's elections when the Democrats won control of the House and could still win control of the Senate. President Bush, uh, actually I'm sorry, President Bush heard the voters' messages loud and clear. They're fed up with the war in Iraq apparently. And today he announced that the man running that war, Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld, is in fact stepping down. And now the president is in the Oval Office. He is about to introduce Donald Rumsfeld's replacement. Robert Gates is president of Texas A&M University. He is also a former director of the CIA. He'll have to be confirmed by the entire Senate, which is now controlled by a Republican majority. But of course, that remains in question on this day. Let's go now to the Oval Office. We're waiting for him to come in so we can give you some more information about Robert Gates. As I mentioned, he served as director of the CIA, CIA from 91 till 93. House. Earlier today, I announced my intent to nominate Robert Gates to be the next Secretary of the Defense. And now I'm pleased to introduce him to the American people. I also am looking forward to paying tribute to the man he will succeed. America remains a nation at war. We face brutal enemies who despise our freedom and want to destroy our way of life. These enemies attacked our country on September the 